Today on Marketing Mavericks, we talk to Jeff Winsper, who's the founder and CEO of Black Ink ROI, about why marketing is the new sales and why data is the new currency of business. That and more coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Marketing Mavericks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Marketing Mavericks is brought to you by LegalZoom. Get your life organized and protect your family with a will or a living trust. Plus, incorporate your business or form an LLC. LegalZoom is not a law firm, but can connect you with an independent attorney. Visit LegalZoom.com and use offer code MM to receive $10 off at checkout. This is Marketing Mavericks, episode 43, recorded Thursday, February 19th, 2015. Marketing ROI. Welcome to Marketing Mavericks, where we talk about everything at the intersection of marketing and technology. And today we're going to talk a lot of hard business data research and what that all means and how sales and marketing is using it today, especially as we advance further and fur further into the technology and data that's available. What's kind of the evolution of sales and marketing? Are we really marketing people? Are we sales people? And how are we getting data quick enough? We're going to talk about all of that. Uh, before we do, I want to thank Anthony, our technical director. Hello. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Holla, Anthony and Sven. Sven is also here. Yeah, you know, I'm... Um I'm more than just a person with a dog. So <laughs> could, oh, although lately, I forgot to record. Can we can we do that again? Oh, really? No, I'm just kidding. What? Wait. Go ahead. I'm kidding. We're recording. <laughs> now he's just messing with me. That's not very nice, Anthony. <laughs> so Sven should have, have a special role on the show, right? I mean, he should have his own like. No? What? Yeah, he doesn't have a camera on him, so I can't. <laughs> well, our guest is definitely going to be happy, uh, hopefully, that we get to him, and that is Jeff Winsper. He is the president and founder at Black Inc. and at Jeff Winsper on Twitter. Uh, welcome, Jeff, to the show. Thank you, Tony. Pleasure to be here. I have to thank a good friend, uh, Jennifer uh, for Fleming, for, who has at uh, Hazel Group for introducing me to you and what you guys are doing. Really interesting stuff. And I think probably one of the biggest questions that marketers have uh, and salespeople have and, and, and certainly CEOs have is how is their organization changing? How is the, the what used to be silos of sales and marketing uh, evolving? And what is really a salesperson today? What is a marketing person today? And how are we using research? Uh, the big term that we've been using for the last couple of years that... I'm hoping we'll change, and we actually lo lose the first word, which is big data, right? Yes. Yeah, I, uh, I, I think that the, uh, the market's evolving very, very rapidly. I, I've been doing this for about 25 years, and I would have to say in the last two or three, uh, the changes have been dramatic. Now, in some cases, the changes are for the better. In some cases, people are still thrashing about. But uh, it's all good, and I think that uh, the world is colliding, and then that's why I think when the marketing and technology come together, we can add a little spice of some analytics and data on top of it. And here we are in 2015 with uh, people uh, advancing the cause around sales and marketing. So, but before we get to your company and kind of the background, I have to say that um, you've had a very stressful uh, winter, at least in the last couple of weeks. In fact, you were saying before the show, uh, you held up a newspaper, the front page of the newspaper today. Yes. And I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to totally out you on this, Jeff, that you were actually one of the participants that uh, the newspaper was referring to. In fact, the mayor has candidly scolded you and many yes. others because the mayor says, stop jumping in the snow. You're in Boston and you're covered in snow and you're jumping from, what, did you jump from your roof? Is that what you did or what? Yeah, it was only like 25 feet. But uh, <laughs> when you think about it, uh, we have seven feet on the ground, so it's only like net 15. So it wasn't that too big of a jump. Uh, but clearly, um, if I may so put this here, uh, the mayor is telling me to chill uh. out. So I, and my, my wife is, was, was advocating this, which you could imagine, but uh, would be just the opposite as you would think. But after being on the roof, shoveling five feet of snow, I said I had to go do it. So I did it. Jeff, the mayor says stop. Please stop. 
<laughs> well, you know, I, I'm in. The, I don't even. I don't live in Boston, so he can't really tell me what to do. So I figured, you know, whatever. I'm just doing it anyway. <laughs> You're kind of a rebel. You know, I I do think I feel bad for you guys. What have you gotten? A total of what? Seven feet? I heard you told me this morning. Just about seven feet. Uh, I don't know what it is. There you go. That's a beautiful photo. I don't know what it is, but my town always seems to make the record. Uh, it's sort of like Norwell again gets 30 inches, and the town next to me gets 11, and then Norwell again gets 30 inches, and so it's uh, they have no more place to put it, and uh, it's getting out of hand. It's, it took me about uh, I don't know, like two and a half hours to go 20 miles this morning. I imagine with your love of golf that that's you actually uh, at the top of that uh, big mountain of snow. But, you know, we'll get to that in a minute. I'm actually going to talk about no that. Problem. So so let's back up a little bit. You're the founder of Black Ink ROI. What is Black Ink ROI? Black Ink ROI is a software company. It's a uh, software as a service company. And what we do is we help C-level executives, uh, CFOs, uh, chief revenue officers, chief marketing officers, chief financial officers, all the way through the day-to-day -day marketing operations and sales operations, get the perfect view or the most complete view of the entire uh, business operations. And it allows them to understand the performance of the investments made both in sales and marketing. And so we find that this is an interesting white space as uh, many, many organizations are struggling to try to find that answer, both in terms of understanding ROI of the past as well as maybe perhaps understanding where to place their bets in the future. And um, it's uh, so far it's going great. No complaints. Thank you. <laughs> no complaint. Thanks you. We're out of here. That's enough. No, uh -huh. that's not. <laughs> so uh, so let's go back a little bit. Before you founded this company, and, uh, and I, I just have to preface again by saying that this is something that as a, a marketer myself and having worked for a lot of organizations that are trying to keep up and and you have so many people in this space that are at different levels of understanding so i mean like using my hands like you know but you have people that are still today just trying to wrap their heads around uh this evolution of the salesperson and the marketing person and the organization's understanding of data and then you have people at the forefront um and many of those people are some of them utilizing the great software like yours that are out there um but certainly we even have software companies that are out there that are were not did not even exist a year ago or two years ago or five years ago um so there's still there's a very overwhelming amount of information that can be gathered and, and then there's the, the personnel, the employees that are trying to keep up with that, including their CEOs, but even the salespeople who are not selling today that the way they sold before. In fact, I would say, I think I've heard you say that uh, marketing is the new sales. With, what does that mean? Well, uh, you know, there's an argument that says, so, some people have an argument that uh, sales, is, uh, well, let's say, well, I'd say uh, marketing is the parent of sales. I mean, if you go back to some of the fundamentals, like the four Ps, it says the four P's of marketing. It doesn't say three P's and one S being sales. So, I mean, I don't really buy into the divide between sales and marketing. I, I always believe that a, a good marketer can do just as good a job of selling as a salesperson could do with marketing because I think they're very much aligned. But, you know, the, the whole explosiveness that has occurred in the last, like, four or five years is really tremendous. And really, if you think about marketing and the channels available today, uh, at their disposal, there's about 60 different channels from social to digital to email, et cetera, where you can communicate directly with the consumer. Now, if you go back like 10 years ago, it was uh, very, very hard for uh, a department called marketing to, to communicate directly with consumers. So at each and every engagement, I would have to argue if marketing does a pretty good job, they're trying to sell the brand uh, on behalf of uh, the overall organization. Do you market your product, your software to um, mid-sized companies, large companies? Who uses um, Black Ink? Yeah, the, t the typical uh, company profile is companies right around, let's say, $250 million in annual revenue and above. That, that's not to say that it couldn't work for organizations with revenues uh, down uh, below that. But, but basically what happens is as organizations get larger and larger and more complex and more global, then of course the data is everywhere. And it makes it more and more challenging for an executive, so to speak, sitting in a corner office to have a total view of his or her enterprise. And marketing, interestingly enough, is one of those processes that cut across all the departments. So it's not as if 
you know, you can point to the department down the hallway and say, hey, tell me what the globe is doing. It's not how it usually works. Um, and fundamentally, unlike sales that actually generate uh, reports in their region and then just roll it up, marketing takes a dollar and it rips it and then it rips it again and it rips it again and it rips it again and it's spread across the whole globe. And, uh, you know, billion dollar organizations see less and less of their customer sets and, uh, you know, the data as they get bigger and bigger. So that's why Black Ink kind of aggregates it all for them, makes it easy to consume and then get to the universal truth. And of course, at the end of the day, provide the insight that they need to make better decisions uh, to engage with their consumers and customers. So one of the questions in the chat room is, how do you get in front of these CEOs? I mean, I know how I get in front of them and, and how I know other, maybe other marketers or uh, salespeople do, but how do you get in front of them, especially those I would think that um, aren't actively looking for an answer to a question that they know that they have? I mean, I think those are probably easier, right? Because they're going to seek you out. They're going to find you. What about the mm -hmm. ones that are just overwhelmed and challenged? Are you getting in front of those as well? And if so, how? Yeah, typically uh, at the larger organizations, our first engagement isn't typically with the CEO, uh, but the CEO is the one who is perhaps driving the agenda and the strategy for the whole organization and the growth goals. So invariably what happens is the question that they have may be about marketing's contribution to the business as a whole. That usually gets funneled down uh, through the Office of Finance and then to the uh, department heads or the business unit leaders. And they're the ones that are struggling to try to provide that answer back up through the CEO and or the boardroom or the executive leadership team. At that point, that's when it starts to, the rubber hits the road and they are starting to raise their hand and the knee gets a little bit greater and they're the ones who usually engage with us first. That said, um, when we engage with those people, then what's happening is we're opening up the skies and what seemed to be murky and confusing and challenging uh, then moves into the the, uh, the the corner office, and then we're answering questions that um, that they had that uh, they could not answer before. Otherwise, they wouldn't have asked the question. Sales has always had such a negative connotation. Nobody likes sales. In fact, in some some circles, marketing has the same connotation and PR and and and. But you know, there's so much opportunity now for any business to continue to grow with this information like yourself, but we also need other tools, I think, you know, or, or I guess my question to you would be, how do you work with other software tools that are out there? There's so many, um, this actually came up in the chat room, CRM tools like a Salesforce, or how do you work with uh, maybe some others? We've had guests on the show that, that like Nimble and that sort of thing where yeah. you're trying yeah. to marry different relationships. Um, how, how does that work? Yeah, so um, what, what, what the, the best way to sort of address it is, um, outline the questions that you want to get answered first, and those questions may be anything from, you know, is there a growth market in uh, a particular region of the country, or you know, can I launch a better a, a product and, and penetrate more market share in another part, or who's my best customer? Whatever the questions are, uh, once you have the set of questions that will feed into the strategy, then you kind of worry about what kind of technology is available to help support it. Often the case, the question seems very normal and rational. Uh, yet the technology itself is almost in a lot of cases only showing part of the answer or in some cases, quite frankly, it's impeding the ability to get to the answer. So we're, we're, we're honestly technology agnostic. We're, what, what I think organizations are starting to realize is that information is the currency of business. And so if information is the currency of business, then really data is the ore. Um, and so when the data is being able to be extracted from those applications per se, and then put into a system where you can actually see the truth, then it doesn't really matter, you know, what system's being used. Now with the CRM comment, clearly relationship management is important and that has evolved over time. If you recall, it was originally um, an SFA tool and it was a, a contact management tool and those things. Um, in, but that's good, but usually that's around post customer acquisition and marketing a lot of cases are ahead of the curve they're trying to create the demand create the preference for the brand trying to generate pipeline which doesn't typically always reside in the crm system itself it usually sits in let's say marketing automation tools or general pr or social or advertising activities so we've got to have to marry the two and and if you think about it sales and marketing uh i don't know like 20 years ago uh they were one department it used to be a person called VP of sales and marketing. Uh, it was rare you ever saw VP of marketing and sales, number one. 
Uh, but now when the, the sort of the division occurred, when there was like a VP of sales and then a VP of marketing, it's almost like in a lot of cases they create a large division not only between the customer, but also like their operations. So now I suspect there's probably been, I don't know, billions of dollars spent to try to get the two to combine. And that's why, you know, information that sits at a CRM and it has to be extracted and then you got to take the marketing automation stuff and you got to extract it then you got to put it together. So it's a little bit of a challenge. It's getting better, uh, but there's still a long way to go. And then if you think about the software companies that provide CRM, you know, they're not always built for the natural processes of marketing or all the channels. They don't always handle social or advertising or sponsorships or events. So it ends up being a very narrow view of what the potential truth is when we're engaging with our consumers. You've um, you've used this term. I know you've talked to and you work with a lot of people that, that do this. I think you've get you again. You, you have all of this information that's that's and you, and you just quoted information is the currency of business. And if that's truly the case, the more information you have, one would think that the more valuable uh, the internal knowledge that you have and the more valuable your right. company might be. But again, it's what you do with that data. And, and, and you've talked, talked about this. I mean, we have all kinds of information, but we really don't know how to utilize it to gain more customers, to drive revenue, uh, retain customers, retention and loyalty. You know, we're not we're not figuring it out. So what's the what's the missing piece of, in the puzzle? Well, I mean, I, I think there's like three levels uh, when we're talking about <clears throat> data and information and so forth. And I think at the, at the baseline level, it, it, I think that there's the argument, it's called data-driven marketing, all right? And then, and then you're right, there's a lot of information in there because once data is uh, uh, collected, which is just a moment in time and it's shared with others, then it becomes information. But uh, there's a lot of information that doesn't provide insight. So I think the next level is, is insight-driven uh, marketing where you're really getting to the core essence of what motivates consumers to purchase or not purchase from you or others. Um, but, you know, really insight does take human capital in, in marriage with technology. I, I don't think you can um, argue one or the other uh, being separate. I think together it makes more sense. There's always that notion that data drives and gut decides. And uh, I think that, you know, for anyone to think that the technology is always going to give the insight is, is um, maybe perhaps not seeing the full truth. But then I think that the, where, where the world is moving in a much more, let's say, progressive standpoint is going to be innovation-driven marketing. And there are some organizations like GE and Nike that are already there where they've got the data sets, you know, they're already consuming the information, uh, they're gathering the insight on the consumers and the segments. And now what's happening is they're developing product uh, with chips in apparel, for example, or chips in sort of, uh, you know, oil rigs. Uh, and they're actually starting to understand how to actually develop new products that progress and that can either change societies or communities. I mean, it is almost becoming a data, uh, sort of a, a data-driven economic society. Uh, so I think that that's the third level. So the maturity cycle is, yep, a lot of data, got it, all right? Some of it's old and dark and inside, some of it's transactional, let's aggregate it, let's consume it, let's try to find some answers. Next stage is, you know what? Maybe this information is useful to help drive our strategy. Uh, maybe make smart choices in our forecasting and funding and pointing our you know, activities in social and advertising towards certain consumers. I think the third level, there is a very small number of organizations that are there. And it would be typical of a, like a, uh, you know, an 80-20 rule or, or sort of a pyramidal approach. But having too much information isn't always helpful. I think what's best is uh, only consuming the information that gives you the answers that you need to uh, you know, move the business forward and have a better, happy customer. So you mentioned Nike, you mentioned a lot of brands and you're, you kind of went down the space of wearable, which I think is our next really big, as a, as, as a marketer, uh, an advantage, an opportunity, also a little scary because yeah. you have now the ability to take data that's very, very real time from your consumer and you not only have this report anymore that you, you printed out with information on it, you've got wearable data that's huge in, in, in building a relationship with your customer. And, and you talked about Nike taking advantage of that. Why is it working so well for them? What are they doing that is helping them stay ahead of other brands and other businesses that are uh, entering this space? Yeah, um, at Nike and or BMW, I can talk a little bit about both. I mean. Uh, what Nike is doing is they're basically saying, 
I'm going to treat each individual as an individual. And that speaks to their brand about the aspiration of the individual itself. And by putting technology into the apparel, while you make a good point that it, perhaps it's a little spooky, what they're trying to do is start to learn. They're trying to learn about Jeff Winsper, or Tanya, or a group of people, or, or geo region, or a type of athlete, which of course, as you can imagine, starts to feed into what would be the best kind of products to build, whether it's for uh, high extreme conditions or for the everyday jogger. Uh, but really, what's interesting too is as they're collecting this information, you can imagine there's a whole host of applications. Health would be one of them. Um, and you know, I think they're trying to figure out right now with all this information, you know, is it uh, A, appropriate for the brand or appropriate in general to use this to help drive maybe perhaps other sort of innovative ways to help people that have maybe diabetes or a particular uh, you know, condition uh, to, to either not just build a product, but also come up with information they can sell at some point. Um, you know, that would be a good example. I, mean, I got a BMW last year. I haven't had one in a while that's, uh, that's been new. And, you know, it's, I'm, I'm in condition to think that every 3,000 miles, I'm supposed to go get an oil change just because that Jiffy Lube did a really good job on that. And then all I realized, I'm like 6,000 miles in, and I'm like, you know, I need to get an oil change. And, you know, I call up to the place, and they're like, nope. Nope. And I'm like, okay, you sure I don't need oil change? Like, no, just press a few buttons and it's going to tell you uh, when you need to come in. In fact, the car is just going to call you up and tell you to come in. Okay. So really, I bought a like a $70,000 computer. Uh, and, you know, I, I wonder how I can try to figure out how to maintain it. And it basically is giving me all the guidance necessary to tell me, just go to where you need to go, A to B, and we'll take care of the rest. I mean, that really is, when you think about it, data. And they're using that to help inform, um, you know, my behavior as a driver. I'm sure they're aggregating that up um, and applying it to their dealers uh, as well as trying to figure out, um, you know, driving patterns and as such. You know, I talk to my car all the time. I tell her she's great and we thank you a lot. And she probably doesn't like the fact that I haven't changed her oil as maybe when I'm, she would probably be calling me like, my, you know, what? <laughs> I get it. Um, yes. You're late. Come on. Let's but, go. But those are fair luxuries, if you will, those are not necessarily the other space that you mentioned was, sure. which is healthcare. And I think that is a space where the data can, um, is, is a little, uh, interesting. Uh, and it's a controversy because although it can be very helpful, um, it can also, you know, be a privacy issue. Right. And so there are people that are a little concerned that their wearable clothing or their wearable utensils or their kitchen yeah. or things that they have, their refrigerator that talks to them in this future that we are building for ourselves is going to be one that it, this privacy does not really exist. And and how are how are brands approaching this? Are they excited? Or are they conscious that this could be an issue and uh, putting together safeties? I mean, what do, you, what do you see in this space? I have a chip in my belt and it's telling oh, me that no. I'm not a, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's saying don't just eat soup today. You're, you, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think it depends on the category. Honestly, with healthcare, with uh, it's a highly regulated category. Uh, with HIPAA and you know financial services with FINRA, so those tend to be on one end of the spectrum. You know there is a difference between privacy and security, and I think that a wearable technology inside, let's say a Nike suit, it's not as if it's exposing me, Jeff Winsper. I mean it's aggregated information. I mean think about Google; they have tons of information on, and they could expose it if they decide to or not, and they choose not to. It's just that uh, you know we don't want to share the name Jeff Winsper and my belt saying that maybe perhaps I've gone one notch further than I should and it's talking back to me. I don't think that's quite where it's heading. And who um, gets to decide what that notch is? I mean, that's the, that's the thing as well is who gets to I decide like where you should be? You know, you know, the mayor's telling you not to jump like in the snow, although probably really good advice, by the way. Yes, yeah. My, I think my wife tells me what notch it should be at, but, you know, that's a side, it's a different story. I, you know, I think... Uh, you know, but you know, I think basically, if you if you're a good moral organization and you have good foundations, I don't think that organizations are going to try to take advantage of an individual unnecessarily. Uh, that's definitely where they don't want to head. I just think that they want to learn as much as possible, produce the best products possible for their for their organizations. Uh, you know, serve them well. I mean, even the supply chain to make sure there's enough Doritos on the shelf for the Dorito eaters, as well as the healthy water bottle people. I mean, it's, I think they're just trying to make um, you know society as a whole move forward. I remember that Tom Cruise movie where he's walking through and you know it's like, hey, would you like to buy these jeans? Would you like to buy this jacket? I hope it doesn't get to that point. 
Uh, it's clearly invasive and fairly disruptive. Jeff, that's totally what's going to happen. Absolutely, no, that's what's going to happen. I don't want it to. I'm in marketing. <laughs> I don't want that to happen. I know. We know it's happening. But, you know, but hopefully it'll be uh, the, the kinds of things we want to know about uh, versus yeah. the, you know, the, the flood of junk spam that we get. And that's where we're trying to figure this out. I think yeah. one company, and certainly there are others that are trying to figure this out, is like uh, EMC, who they've built like a science lab, right? And they're really, this idea of science and business is, is, is fairly new, um, but it is really science now. It's really determining what, uh, what we should do next. Talk about the EMC Science Lab, what you know about them. Yeah, so they're, they're on the upper edge. Uh, I, I know those guys personally, they're, they're, they're superstars. And when it first started out, well, first of all, EMC is a software slash storage organization, you know, multi-billion dollar company. And uh, what, they, what they did was they built a science lab uh, on behalf of their customers. So as the customers were using EMC's information, what they were doing was trying to help support uh, them by you know, creating pilots to say, hey, geez, if you had this kind of information, GE, for example, which I believe is one of the customers, look what you can do. And so they kind of give that little edge to say, hey, it's not just about EMC, although that's, I'm sure, part of their sales pitch. It's about the possibilities, uh, where the world could go for someone like a GE who could perhaps save babies' lives with better technology. So as they were going through and building the science lab to indirectly sell their product, what they started to realize is, hey, geez, this is really good stuff. And we at EMC may want to take it on. And if you think about the word science lab and marketing, it adds a whole new dimension because marketing really is a social science. Um, it's not a physical science. And it's just tremendous. And there you go, Jeremy Burton, who is very much a, uh, a guy who loves big data and, and they go into the science lab and you have the ability to start to target certain consumer sets. It really helps their enable their sales force. It's pretty cool stuff. Uh, they were on a panel I was running at the BMA and um, one of the guys on the, on the panel was like, hey, you know, um, the guy, the, the science tech geek over there who may have not been invited to the Christmas party, I think he or she is going to be right at the table and he's going to be everyone's hero. I mean, and that's what's happening is I think that shift is occurring because it's sort of like, hey, um, you know, what are you doing in there? And, you know, it's like, you know, the mad scientist. And it's like, ta-da, I got something you may have never thought of before. And everyone's like, how did you know that? Well, and they algorithms and propensity models and blah, 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 blah. And they come back with answers that are pretty mind-blowing. And they're doing a really, really good job. And, of course, the customers that consume EMC um, obviously are taking advantage of that as they move forward. GE is one of them, yeah. Yeah, no, I think they're doing some amazing things. I think we're going to see more science labs. We're going to really see a huge organizational shift continue to happen inside. You know, we, we used to, I don't know, would say we were joke, we were serious about it, but the role of the CMO has changed and the CIO and what does that mean? And I think we're still trying to figure out what that organizational chart really looks like and what yes. kind of departments that we have and how they work together. It's going to be a lot different, I think, in the next couple of years. But No doubt. And I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about archetypes and um, this idea of B2B versus B2C, KPI, and some of these words that we throw around and what those, how those have changed. But before we do, I actually want to thank one of our a sponsor of Marketing Mavericks, and that's LegalZoom. The best time to start getting your life organized is right now. And the easiest place to do it is LegalZoom.com. Getting your life organized, well, starts with protecting your family and a great way to take control of your family's future is making a will or living trust. That's where LegalZoom can help. There's no easier way to make sure your family is legally taken care of. Getting your life organized also means taking control of your financial affairs. We all need to do that. And sometimes owning your own business is, makes it a little challenging for us to kind of wear all those different hats. So if you're thinking of starting a business or you have one already, Legal Zoom can help you form your business and provide the support you need to run it successfully. For more than 10 years, LegalZoom has helped millions of people get the personalized attention that they need. And if you need legal advice or guidance, they can connect you with independent attorney in most states since they are not a law firm. So here's my suggestion, because we all put things off that we don't love. This is going to help make your life easier. Don't wait any longer 
to organize your life and use their offer code MM to receive $10 off at checkout for legal help you can count on and for your family or a small business. Go to LegalZoom.com today and remember to use offer code MM for $10 off of your order. We thank LegalZoom for their support of Marketing Mavericks. And I can tell you personally that getting your life organized as a small business owner can be really challenging because you're trying to do everything. And we've all been there, even working for a startup. I know you yourself, Jeff, have started companies, uh, including this one. And sometimes when you're trying to do a lot, you actually have to reach out and get help from people. And uh, you've done that. In fact, uh, were you a little scared? Were you a little nervous? Or were you excited when you started uh, Black Ink? I had uh, I had uh, giddiness inside me for many many years before I decided to make that decision. I want to let you know though, you may you obviously you don't know this. I actually uh, incorporated Black Ink through LegalZoom. <laughs> See <laughs> right true. there. Yeah. It, it's true. Yeah, I mean, uh, I just uh, you know I, I obviously have lawyers for other things, but uh, I was like I'm going to go to LegalZoom because it was easy, it was fast, and they they uh, they did a bang up job. Anyway, that just happened to be ironic that that's the sponsor <laughs> for the show. So. Uh, Get legal zoom. It's good. Uh, anyway, so I, so I've been in the marketing field for about 25 years, and I've been on the vendor side or the supplier side, otherwise known as, let's say, an agency, where we provided some consulting and things like that. And we were dabbling with a bunch of analytics for many, many years. My first client was Bombardier, um, and we helped them out in uh, in the Texas uh, region. But anyway, so one of the things that kind of spurred and just kind of went into my head was. You know, I think in about maybe seven or eight years from now, now, that's I think about seven years ago, but now it's happening. I think marketing is going to change dramatically. Uh, the function um, and the discipline and the organizational structure, the principles don't change, but I think like the organizational behavior was going to change. Uh, we kind of guessed uh, that maybe perhaps that when the pipes got bigger in the internet, there'd be more data flow. Uh, we sort of did a hypothesis that the channels would start to be uh, more complex channels as defined by, uh, let's say, digital or social. They weren't that prevalent when we first started out. And we were thinking like, you know what, if I'm in marketing and I run a large budget or even a small budget for that matter, and now I'm trying to communicate with my client 12 different ways, 15 different ways, and now I'm communicating with them directly, at some point, someone's going to say, hey, is it working? Now, that question has been around for years about the 50% wood chop is working, which is quoted from Wanamaker, but I just thought it was going to come a lot faster. So what we did was we said, you know what, is there a way we can actually celebrate uh, the notion that marketing and sales can work together to make a profound incremental difference to the revenue streams at the organization? So when I, you know, when I was in these new business meetings as the vendor prior to opening up Black Inc., it was frustrating because you'd sit across the table with the CEO and you make it a big pitch and you're saying, hey, you know, we can do your ads and we can do your, you know, whatever, direct mail and events. And you know the CEO uh, is quietly sitting in the pitch for the whole hour, doesn't say one thing, you know, and, and he's, you know, I'll say he, his burly eye is up like this, his well, arms she could be a she. She could be a she it's, with a burly was, eye. Uh, okay, whatever, burly eye, she, you know, just arms crossed and... You know, and then at the end of the meeting, they would ask the question and uh, they would say, hey, Jeff, is this going to work? And I'm thinking like, hmm, I think his it is marketing ROI. And I don't think it means the color on the page. So, you know, I'm sure everybody has been there before. You kind of dance around it and say, hey, yeah, it's going to work. And, you know, it worked for them. It could work for you. But really, at the end of the day, we wanted to define it, measure it, uh, monitor it, and improve it, it being uh, marketing ROI. And, that, and then once we made that leap of faith and we w worked in a whole bunch of ways, it, um, it really opened up for me. So it was a really giddy uh, resurgence again. It's my third company I've started up. So, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Good, Good times. <laughs> Thanks to LegalZoom. So, yes. <laughs> thank you, LegalZoom. <laughs> so the... The idea of the mentality, you, you talked about, your, you, you stereotyped what I think a lot of people would envision maybe, you know, certainly in the past, um, a CEO might look like a, you know, grumpy old CEO. Uh, that's not the case. The successful ones really aren't that way any longer. And you have a, a much different uh, point of view from the, as a salesperson or a marketing person looking at the new CEO. What is this, what is the, the characteristics or personality traits um, mm. that drives business today versus even five years ago. 
Um, what is that person who's, if the CEO is hiring a CMO or if a board of directors is hiring a CEO, what should they look for? Yeah, great question. I mean, beyond the, the traditional uh, required skill sets like financial management, you know, uh, organizational management behavior, being a good leader and inspiration, what, the, the, the things that we're seeing right now is the, the, the non burly eyed female or male running the organization. They, they, um, they're very much an outside in leader, uh, not so much an inside out leader. And what we mean by that is they are much more tuned to understanding, keeping their ear to the rail, so to speak, and trying to understand what's best for the marketplace or the consumers. And it's a whole different perspective than sort of the command and control that used to exist through, let's say, 60s until, let's say, the, you know, maybe the 2000s. So those leaders are really starting to say, what's it going to take to acquire, retain, satisfy those consumers or those customers? Once you have that conversation, it opens it up a lot. And, and it really starts to create a culture uh, top down and then it spreads from the inside out that, you know what, we're here for you uh, to provide service for our consumer set. Virgin does a really good job of that. You know, they know that they want to be provide the best experience at the, at the most reasonable price. And, um, you know, and they pay it off. So that, that's where we see some of those trends occurring uh, that are consumer centric. I mean, furthermore, you know, I, I uh, sometimes get into, let's say, a meeting and let's say there's 20 people in the room representing all the different functions. And, you know, I could start to see where maybe perhaps not everyone's aligned. I simply ask the question, anybody in the room that's in charge of the customer, please raise your hand. Right. And what typically happens is you, you see like, uh, uh, all right, I guess we're all in charge of the customer. Yeah, we're all in charge of the customer. But Jeff, we've been start... saying that for years. We've all said that we have uh, responsibility for the customer. So how has that changed? Um, through action and attitude. I mean, I think, you know, when you say who's, who's responsible for the customer is a little different than saying what part of the customer are you responsible for? And I think when you have a, a more uh, macro view uh, at an organization, they're teaming up and putting the customer in front of the table. I think you still see where maybe perhaps the opposite occurs, which is like, oh, I'm in the call center, so I'm, always, I'm only supposed to take care of people when they're frustrated, or I'm in sales and I'm only helping them in the beginning part of the stage. No, that's not really what's happening. So a lot of the CEOs, when they do put the customer in the middle um, and then the organizations change their behavior and they have interlocking processes as opposed to dividing processes, that would be perhaps uh, a portion of the archetype that you asked about earlier. Okay, so let's talk about one that's kind of, I think, when you mentioned getting in front, because I've been saying that for years. I used to, you know, in the early days of that's my hard. career, we won't say when, um, I used to teach sales training and build sales culture and everything from a commission, working with uh, product management and pricing all the way to like literally getting them hired and out in the field. So that has completely changed, right? At least uh, for the most part in how we understand customers. And I think our leadership has changed as well. And the mentality of an organization has changed. And I think John Ledger comes to mind when I think of T-Mobile and the fact that, that all levels of management actually get on the phones. And then what made me think of it was you mentioned call centers. Uh, they get on the phones and they talk to customers. They have a relationship with customers. So they, it's really inbred in their organization. And you see it as yes. a consumer. And I've heard you talk a lot, a lot about that in the past, uh, it, recently anyway, how as consumers we see an organization, because we're talking about sales, we're talking about marketing, we're talking about CMOs and CEOs. But as consumers, how consumers view us is really what drives our business. And I think consumers see T-Mobile as a company that's trying to listen to them and potentially trying to fight for them. What would you say about that? I think it's a very strong argument. I mean, if you th think about it, we're all consumers, so they don't think departments or functions or data or any of this. They just think about what they do when they wake up and they kind of want what they want when they want it. And, you know, that's nothing new. I think what's what's happening is um, because there was only a few ways you could interact with a brand in the past, which was either you could mail them, okay, they could mail you. Um, you could show up face-to-face -face depending on the business model. You can make a phone call. Okay, now think about it. There's like a whole host of different ways you can engage with a brand. So managing the interactions, what I believe is a more um, experiential approach is really tough. So when you think about T-Mobile, you know, they did a great job because if you think about maybe perhaps how that category is set up, it's restrictive. 
uh, the plans are confusing. Sometimes the consumers feel like they're getting robbed. There's contracts. I mean, really what he did was say, hey, all things being equal, we're going to prioritize the top 10 things that maybe most consumers or our customers do not appreciate about our business, not just T-Mobile, but the category business. And what if we just ripped that out? What would, what would it be like? What are the possibilities? Well, if you think about it, really what he did was provided the possibilities of freedom and choice for the consumer. That Really, that's it. Pricing structure, whether you do or do not want a phone, it doesn't really matter, no contracts. And at that point, consumers really glom onto it because, especially in America, we like uh, choice, we like freedom. And uh, he did a, he's done a bang up job, uh, you know, giving that opportunity. And but for a brand that was originally kind of hot, let's say, whew, I don't know how many years now, like 15 years ago when it first started to move out, it kind of uh, weaned away a little bit. And now it's actually being highly attractive to the younger generation uh, that very much wants that uh, flexibility. And, uh, you know, that category is, is still reeling from the success of what T-Mobile is doing. So let's talk about a, an, an industry specifically that is not very well liked. And I know I actually come from that industry and that is the cable television industry. In fact, a bad word is sometimes in, in many people, uh, their conversations or their dialogue or their home is the word Comcast or Comcastic. Oh, yeah. and, I, and, I, and I've worked for Comcast, so I understand their challenges. And I understand the challenges of that industry, especially as, uh, as the way as viewers were consuming content today. And so they're trying to, to you know, evolve, uh, not just by listening to customers the way other businesses are, but literally their product is changing and the way they're connecting to customers. What is it that Comcast could do differently um, in listening and maybe, I don't know, is it possible that they can actually be seen differently to consumers than they are? Oof. That's a big how about one. Show up? How about show up when you say you're supposed to show up? Uh-oh, here we go. Oh. <laughs> that window. I'll be there between four and six. No. Yeah, no, no, it's more like I'll be there between Tuesday <laughs> and... Whenever. I mean, really, think about that. It, 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 that alone, I mean, uh, what, what other, can you imagine if I had my customer out here in the lobby and said, hey, I know you're here for me. I know you pay me a lot of money and I know you're under contract. I'm supposed to serve you. I'll get to you sometime next year or next week, or I'm not sure. I mean, it's so counterintuitive to the expectations of what we want as consumers. And you know what, maybe there is a little bit of an analogy between T-Mobile and Comcast. I mean, I mean, the cable is what you could say, you know, quasi-regulated in certain towns or certain counties that you're only allowed to have one or two choices. So, you know, for that, it's challenging. Um, I think basic changes about being more customer-centric for them would be real. How about answering the phone? How about not talking about 10 prompts? I mean, they try to do all their, um, you know, their break fix over the phone. And I'm no dummy, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, I unplugged it. I put it back in. Yeah. I unplugged it I love again. it. That is you know, totally you know? the... And then I'm like, I have to call my 21-year-old and it's like, hey, Jeff, can you fix this for me? He's like, dad, I, 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 I know a lot. It's broken. Just tell him to show up. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know how it is because labor on the field is expensive and it takes and drains away from their, um, drains away from the revenue or the profit. I'll, I'll tell you an interesting uh, story. There's a bridge that was being built in my town and I think the span was, oh, I don't know. Let's just call it 75 yards. It took 10 years to fix the bridge. Now, my buddy, who happens to live in the town, uh, was working on the bridge. He's a slurry union dude. And I was like, what's up with the bridge? And he said, just so you know, the bridge cannot be fixed because Verizon, not Comcast, but Verizon in this particular case, um, will not um, move the cable onto the bridge and we're stuck. So that tells you how infrastructure uh, can create a lot of ooh, unhappy people. Full disclosure, I've worked for both Comcast and Verizon. So <laughs> full disclosure. But that's what I understand. I understand the challenges that they have, but I also understand that they don't uh, necessarily take advantage. And you, you, these, this is your target customer. This is who you're oh, you're talking to, Jeff. These are the, these are your clients, right? So. Oh yeah. Yeah, well, we have one client. I won't name their. I won't name the company. It's a very, it's a very large energy organization. And you know what was shocking is here we are when energy was deregged. I don't know how many years ago, and I was in a conversation with the CFO and the marketing person, and they disclosed. I said, Jeff, do you realize? 
that for about 150 years, so you can kind of guess who it is, 150 years, we had nothing other than to generate energy and just sent it out on the lines. And when we got deregged, it took us eight years to figure out how to mail the bills to the consumer. Eight years. It, they mastered it after eight years. So you can just imagine as a consumer, you're thinking like, I don't know, I've been getting bills in the mail for years. Why, why is it taking so hard for them? I think it's just because it's, it's just that the industry, like them, have a really tough time ever understanding about what a consumer can choose uh, with their wallet at some point. Sorry to interrupt you, brother. No, no, that's okay. I mean, I, I think one of the things that I'm going to change gears a little bit that you and I talked about that I thought was really interesting and I want to make sure we get to is this next generation of employees. We've been talking a lot about leadership. We've been talking about CEOs and CMOs, salespeople, marketing people, science labs and scientists yeah. in business. Um, and I think the science piece is, uh, and the, 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 certainly our audience and, and beyond is there's so much opportunity right now. You're really struggling finding the talented people that you need and the people that are coming out of school with the skill sets that you need are asking for money that I certainly didn't get when I started my career oh. uh, because there's such a shortage. And, and what is the skill set? What is this talent that you're, you're speaking about? For, for all of the wonderful viewers, if you decide that you like analytics, data science, mathematics, statistics, please, uh, you know, it is a, a growing, growing field. I think uh, the Labor Bureau statistics say there's something like 400,000 jobs that are open between now and the next three years. Really. It's anyone who understands how to manage the fundamentals around data management, um, applying statistical models, mathematical, empirical models, you know, uh, then we're going to the science labs. It's really the collision between technology, um, marketing smarts, data management. It's, it's going crazy. I mean, case in point, um, when uh, we, we put out a, a job posting, uh, we'll get like 100 resumes back. Um, as you know, some of them are not going to cut it, but 98% uh, of them uh, are people that are not from the United States. They're from outside the United States. So I think that the whole notion of building the school system education around math would be really important. But that, that's the challenge. And um, these, these uh, you could argue, kids, kids coming out of college, they haven't stepped one foot into a business and they're asking for mid to high, mid six figure numbers. Low mid six number, you know, over 100,000, 150,000. It's not unheard of for someone coming out of a tech school. It, it's it's crazy. So the demand's there, and uh, you know they know it. I don't know how long it's going to last. It didn't perhaps help that CNBC said two years ago or a year ago. I think it said something like being the data scientist is the most sexiest job alive on earth. So you know we're we're challenged against that. But um, you know it, you know. It, I would just say for anyone who wants to understand the insight versus the data, the combination of those two things is a really super long runway in marketing for the next five years minimum. So, I'm going to out you on something here. Um, so <laughs> he phrases himself. It's not bad. So, Please. You, you know, we talked about wearables earlier, and I know you're a big golfer. You're a super, you know, into golfing, and you tried to get your kids to golf. My dad did the yep. same thing. He made me take um, – a golf lessons. I have blisters on my hands. I remember from all the golf lessons and I was never my, that club. <laughs> my long game. Not so good. Short game. Pretty good. So basically yeah. I could play putt putt. Um, but I was just, I wasn't, I was not cut out to be a golfer as, as a lot of other sports, but, um, but you, you, you admitted something earlier that you still have the original golf clubs that you had in high school. That's what you use. Yeah. So, so there's like two, when you talk about archetypes and profiling golfers, there's the person that shows up with like the latest and greatest Big Bertha, spent three to $4,000 on their clubs. You know, there's this notion that they can hit it, you know, 360 yards. And then there's little old me. So I show up with my old bag. Okay. It's probably 15 years old. My clubs are since high school. Uh, my putter has been since, I mean, I really, uh, unless I lose it, uh, it's from high school. Cause I have to believe that 95% of the performance uh, playing golf is the person. But, but, and maybe five, and, and, and five what? Technology. I think 10% I think is the technology, and you think about it, 95% is the person, just like anything else in this world. So, yeah, I still have my high school clubs. Haven't you heard the Mike's pitch with Mike Golf Shop? I mean, he's trying yeah. to sell you new clubs. There he is. Oh, oh hey, no, Mike. Here's Mike. <laughs> Down at Mike's Golf Shop. 
where we buy golf. That's right. We buy golf clubs. Mike's Golf Shop. Come on over here. We buy golf clubs. <laughs> over at Mike's that's, Golf Shop. That's pretty much it. If you've never seen that Come before. Come <laughs> We buy golf clubs. You can he buy stays mine. on point. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. If you, I mean, this actually went viral. Uh, I think we covered this like a year ago, but it's a crazy. This guy's ads. He's definitely on message the entire time, and he, but he's, it yeah. works for him. So, but he, seriously, can't you get some new clubs? Give Mike your old golf clubs and get some new ones. I'm trying to Mike, give Mike some help out. Mike, help me out. Yeah, well, he's on point because he says the same thing ten times in a row. It's not, <laughs> hard not to. You know, it's like plop, plop, fizz, fizz. You remember it forever. So, you know, good, good, good for Mike. Potentially the only ones of us that think this is funny are people that are in actually the sales and marketing space. So okay. it's pretty funny to us. <laughs> and me, it is funny to me. So, but, you know, it, we showed that picture earlier of the guy standing on a heaping mound of snow uh, playing golf. I would assume that's you right now, right? I, I, I would love to. Uh, I, I, if I could take the camera and show you downtown Boston, it kind of looks like that. I didn't bring my clubs in today, uh, but... I, you know, that inspires me. I think I may want to go home early and, and hit it around a little bit, some irons. So thank you. You're quite welcome. I, I'm really excited about you, what you guys are doing in this uh, next uh, level of understanding data. And I'm hoping that we use, lose the word big in front of big data and we just be, be better consumers of the data that we're getting for our business and that we evolve. So what would your advice be to somebody who's, really struggling with wrapping their head around data, looking for the right software, whether they're a small company, uh, maybe that, you know, you're a little out of their range. What kind of tools would you look at? You know, what kind of advice would you give them and tools would you suggest that they use to try yeah. to help their customers better? Yeah. Um, it'd be hard to be presumptuous about the tool itself, though. I can probably come up with a point of view. I would just say, um, think big, but start small. Um, recognize that once you get to one stage of your maturity cycle, you're gonna run into another wall and that's okay. It'd be no different than anything else. Uh, but I would just try to map out in logical steps, what's the best way to provide the information necessary for your internal customers or your external customers to, to engage in the manner they want. I would probably not advise that you go spend a lot of money and a lot of technology because as we all know, that um, doesn't always pan out because of the infrastructure and the cost and the time and the money, but, but I would just start really small. And if you're, if you're a smaller organization and you wanna engage with you know, the consumer at a, a, at a baseline level, at least from a marketing tool standpoint, clearly things like HubSpot and Constant Contact you know, are perfectly fine. If you're in that moderate range and you wanna engage a little bit, uh, a little more sophisticated with more channels, I would check out things like Eloqua, Marketo. More sophisticated, I would go with like a red point. Uh, they tend to be uh, much better with the money channels. And you know, it's interesting because they, tr they treat each consumer as an individual in their communications, whereas the previous ones, it's more like clusters and segments. So it ends up being more or more, not one-to-one. -one. So I would just kind of mature that way. And uh, But I definitely would say have some level of understanding of data governance. It is crazy the amount of human capital spent to try to get this information in some reasonable form, even just to make a reasonable decision. The, 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 the fidelity level is uh, so important and it's very challenging. So I would say have a data plan, understand what your business requirements are, pick the tech to fit those technology requirements and just go at a natural speed because clearly you can't chew off too much at once. Well, and the chat room is kind of blowing up with more questions they have for uh -oh. you as we're out of time. So if Hi. they want to connect with you, maybe ask you some questions, follow what you're doing, and maybe attend a, a conference where you're going to be or something like that, what's the best way sure. they can do that, Jeff? Uh, they can just do it at the Twitter handle down below uh, if you want. And that's at Jeff Winsper, your name on Twitter. Yep. Uh, they yep. can check out Black Ink, of course. And, um, Black Ink ROI. It's blackinkroi.com. Which yep. is the is also a very important word, ROI, which we use a lot. Return on investment. And Black Ink, which means you're making money. It's better. We were going to call it Red Ink, but then somehow somebody said that's not a good thing. <laughs> yeah, idea. that's probably somebody on your marketing team, I hope. Branding yeah. side. <laughs> oh, I don't know. We consumed all this data at our company and said, no, it's not Red Ink. Mm. It's Black Ink. Thanks again, Jeff. It's been a pleasure Thank having you. you on the show. I'm looking forward to meeting you in person one day. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.
Absolutely. And if you want, you can follow me and our show. You can follow me on Twitter as well at, at Tanya Hall Radio. I respond and I, I listen. And I'll find me on Facebook. I post some of my favorite news stories on technology and marketing. And I'd love to hear what you, your thoughts are on the subjects that we cover here on the show and how you enjoy listening to us as well. And if you have suggestions for guests or feedback on the show, I even, pretty old school, I read email. And you can email me at mavericks, M-A-V-E-R-I-C-K-S, at twit.tv. That's mavericks at twit.tv, and I will listen. So until next week, everybody, have a great time, and we'll talk to you then. Bye.